So we're going to talk about respiratory system. Um, we made our way through this upper respiratory tract. Nasal, oral cavities, the nose and the mouth, and then this cavity of convergence called the pharynx. Now we're going to begin to take a look at the lower respiratory tract. The very beginning of the lower respiratory tract as we move down is this thing called the larynx, also referred to as the voice box. And really the larynx is this section of the respiratory tract that helps to divide the trachea, which goes to the lungs, from the esophagus that goes to the stomach as a component of the digestive system. So, extending from this picture here, just taking a step a little bit further down, trachea is right here, esophagus on the back side. This will be our larynx ear pharynx just above that. From the larynx, we move into the trachea, which leads to the lungs. Trachea, you may also refer to as the windpipe. Total terms. It's the tube, the main branch that leads down into the thoracic cavity and then it partitions off or it bifurcates into a right and to a left. Those bifurcations are called the bronchus. So these are the tubes that divide up where there's divisions left and right. Uh, of the trachea. Now what you can see here in silhouette as you move into either of these lungs, the, the bronchus divide up and then they begin to branch off, forming the, the, the tissue and structure of the lung on both sides of the individual. Those branches, basically the little bronchus, so we call them bronchioles. So these are the branches. And as we go further and further down, these, these branches continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually they terminate. And they terminate into these uh, small sac-like structures. So here we come into these small sac-like structures here through our bronchioles, and you can see that if you really get into the, the naming convention here, you have even different names for the individual bronchioles as we move down into these small sac-like structures. So this sort of is, um, it's been described before as, as a bunch of grapes, sort of looks like a bunch of grapes hanging off the line, uh, or maybe the ends of the broccoli plant. Those terminal ends are called alveoli. So alveolus is going to be the singular. Alveoli is our plural. And again, it's been referred to from the term or from the perspective of grapes as cluster of grapes, just as a descriptive for the Okay. So that's the anatomy from trachea, really from larynx through the trachea, from bronchus, bronchioles to the alveoli. We're going to come back and we'll give the alveoli, or individually alveolus, we're going to give them the individual um, designation as the units of gas exchange. So when you breathe air in, it ends up way down here filling these alveoli, and they're highly, highly vascular, lots of capillaries, and this is where gas is exchanged. CO2 comes out, oxygen goes in, and we'll get to that process in just a little while. Just like I did with the upper respiratory tract, I also want to put some purpose, some purposes here to the lower respiratory tract. Give a little more detail on each of these organs. 
So starting with the very top of the lower respiratory tract, we have the larynx. One of the purposes is to act as the voice box. So this is part of the process of um, being able to, to have a voice and to generate, to generate sound. The larynx is also uh, important to maintain an open airway during breathing, but to also control it and close it down during consumption of food and beverage. So we'll also control that food and the air into the correct into the correct tubes, food to the esophagus, and then air into the trachea on the way to the lungs. Now the way that the larynx helps to control this, so this is a uh, really a high definition, if you will, picture of the larynx. So here's the trachea. Notice the vocal cords are set over the opening of the trachea. So we have this opening here, and then back here is the opening to the esophagus. This cartilaginous structure here is a cartilaginous flap that actually will move sort of like this. So that cartilaginous flap, it's over this opening that's referred to as the glottis. So the opening is the glottis. The epiglottis just literally means the thing that's over the glottis is this cartilaginous flap that's going to help out in this process of controlling where food and air are distributed. So the cartilaginous flap is going to close over the glottis leading into the trachea when you're consuming food or beverage, but will remain open when we're breathing in air. Now, with the presence of those vocal cords, we're going to take a look at those in just a second. The larynx is responsible for generating sound. What was the name of that opening? So that opening is called the glottis. And that's just simply going to be the opening to the trachea. And stretched across that opening or stretched across the glottis is where we're going to find our vocal cords. Those vocal cords look something like this. So your vocal, this, this is going to be the epiglottis here, this is the glottis here, and then these are going to be your vocal cords. We have the ability to change the, uh, the tension on those vocal cords. And this is just like a guitar string, right? If I make the guitar string smaller and tighter, I get a higher pitch. <clears throat> if it's bigger and not as tight, I get a lower pitch. And so we have the ability to do that. And then as we pass air in a controlled fashion through those vocal cords, it helps to resonate and begin to generate sound. All right, so from here, moving through the glottis, we enter into the trachea. And again, this can also be referred to as the windpipe. And the trachea is actually going to control airflow into the lungs. And the way that it does it is it changes the diameter of this particular tube. So what you're seeing here on the back side here is the uh, esophagus. On top is going to be the trachea. And the trachea, here's a cross section down here. You're looking at basically this part of the trachea here, here, and here. These are sort of C-shaped cartilaginous rings. And if you grab onto your trachea, you actually can palpate those and you can feel kind of things like the bendy straw. That's because of the presence of those cartilaginous 
uh, C-shaped rings. So this is all a cartilaginous ring. And then on the back side, we have this muscle that spans the, uh, the opening of the C. And that muscle, it's actually a smooth muscle, but it can be triggered to contract. So what you hopefully are seeing here is as it contracts, it's actually going to reduce the size of that C shape and you're going to reduce the diameter of the tube. So the trachea or the windpipe is comprised of those stacked cartilaginous rings. Again, it's a, a C-shaped ring, so it's not a complete ring, but it has that C-shape. And then intervening between the ends of the C is that smooth muscle. Now, by changing the size of that ring, we can control air movement. When that muscle flexes, what is going to happen to the diameter of that, of that ring? So the muscle flexes and pulls on the pulls on the cartilaginous ring. So it reduces the diameter. Now, as you reduce the diameter, you increase the resistance. You actually have less volume of airflow, but it comes in more force. It's just like taking your finger and putting it over the end of a garden hose. You actually are reducing flow. So if you're trying to fill up a bucket, it's not going to fill up as fast but it's spraying out much further. In the relaxed state, we have an increase in diameter, which reduces the resistance. I I spell resistance correctly. Now, the very inside of the trachea, you can see there's sort of this pink, and then there's some little intervening yellow globs in there. This pink layer is a bunch of cells, and those cells are actually called epithelial cells, which is not necessarily specific to the trachea. It's a type of cell that ends up lining many of our, our different tubes. We also have epithelial cells that line the vessels inside of the circulatory system. So we're lined here with epithelial tissues, and then the little yellow um, uh, cells in there are going to be mucus cells. So you have the, the structural epithelial cells, and then contained within those epithelial cells, you have mucus producing cells. Now, mucus is a viscous substance that actually is going to trap particulates. So as you breathe air in, you're breathing in dust and other particles. And the mucus is actually going to be sticky enough to trap a lot of those particles. Now, the epithelial cells themselves, if we were to look at them at higher resolution or higher detail, what we would see on the very surface that faces into the trachea, what we would call the lumen or the space, there are these hair-like structures, folds in the membrane. And we call those folds cilii. Those cilii or cilia 
they actually have motor proteins that are associated with those little flaps of membrane, and they begin to have this sweeping motion. So as that mucus is produced, it traps the particles, and then those cilia are going to sweep that sticky particle-containing substance away from the lungs, so back up towards your oral cavity. So these cilia, again, these are those hair-like projections of the membrane of the cells that have that sweeping motion, that are going to be able to sweep that mucus containing the uh, particulates that have been trapped away from the lungs. And this is protective of the lungs, because then we don't end up with pollutants and toxins and things like that now inside of the lung tissue, which would hinder gas exchange. It would reduce the ability of the lungs to move oxygen into the bloodstream and to pull CO2 off, and that would begin to shift the individual out of the homeostatic regulation for those two gases. By the way, cigarette smoke causes those cilii to become inhibited and they no longer work as functionally well uh, in an individual who smokes cigarettes as an individual who does not. And so now there's a reduced ability to sweep that mucus away from the lungs and you begin to collect that material deep inside of the lung tissue that begins to affect the gas exchange processes. Uh, as we go a bit deeper here uh, in this tubular system, we, end, uh, we, we move into the bronchi. One of the purposes of the bronchi is to add additional humidity to the air that's being breathed in and also to warm that air. Remember, we're trying to get a high amount of humidity into the air so as it permeates deep inside the lungs, we're not going to dry that tissue out, and then we also want to warm the tissue up close to our body temperature so that once it's deep within the core of the individual, we're not constantly causing a reduction in air temperature. 70 degrees is real comfortable for you on the outside, but it will put you into a hyperthermic state on the inside very, very quickly. We're also going to find cilia and some mucus cells here inside of the bronchi. And this is just additional um, particle trapping support so that we can also sweep that material out. So if you breathe in real dirty air and some of it gets past the trachea, you can also uh, cleanse the air further in the bronchi. And really, we want to do that so that the air ends up moist and sufficiently warm and clean once we enter into the alveoli. Because once we get to the alveoli, the major function here, and we've seen this picture already, but the major function here is to exchange gas across that border from the lung tissue to the bloodstream. So the alveoli are called or are given the credentials the units of gas exchange. So by the time the air that you breathe in makes its way all the way into the alveoli, hopefully it's really clean, humidified, pure air that now can go through and effectively cross that barrier between the lung itself and the bloodstream. So if we were to, to take a look at these individual alveoli sac, sacs. The, the alveoli is, is basically a structure of individual cells. Okay? So we have individual epithelial cells that make up the structure. So the air ends up in here, and then very closely, close by, we have a capillary, which makes up, which is made up of another single layer of cells. So alveoli are unit of gas exchange. They're surrounded by capillaries. And if you really think about this, 
we have two layers of cells that are separating the environment from your blood. Because ultimately we're going to fill up that alveoli with air. And it's air that we're taking in from our surrounding environment. So we got that one epithelial cell making up the LOB line, and then we have the one cell that makes up the wall of the capillary. Now, this structure here and having it in a round shape is very critically important. It's, it's phenomenal design. Because that round structure means that we can have the maximum amount of contact in the capillaries. So we have a really high surface area. And this is critically important because it's going to be that surface area that is where we have our exchange that's occurring between the air that we breathe in and the bloodstream that's circulating just below the cell surface. And we want to optimize and maximize the amount of oxygen and CO2 that can be exchanged from the bloodstream. Okay, again, alveoli are in very close contact with the capillaries. This also is going to be a very important point to understand because that close contact means that we have a very small distance. And this is a small distance between the air that we breathe in and the blood that is circulating and needs to be undergo. Uh, undergo gas exchange. Because the reason that this is important is because that small distance is still a distance that that oxygen molecule has to travel. And the longer the distance, the harder it is for that molecule of oxygen to travel. This is occurring through diffusion. Diffusion is entirely random. It would be like me just sitting here and I walk with no apparent direction now. And eventually I'm going to get to the door, but if I don't really have any directionality, it's going to take a really, really long time. Oxygen is doing that as well. It's moving without any sort of directionality. But if I'm really, really close to the door, the oxygen is really, really close to the blood when it's inside of the, uh, the, the capillary, I'm going to bump into that door relatively quickly. So because it's random, this diffusion is guided by no apparent process. It's just simple, random movement. The closer we are to the target, the higher the probability that we're going to end up bumping into what we need to bump into. And in the case of the alveoli, it's bumping into cells to be transported into the bloodstream. Now, in addition, so um, let's step back a little The surface of water. You've all gone down to a pond or a lake and you've seen those little insects that are called water striders. Why can they move across the surface of the water? Or there's that lizard called the vasculus lizard, also called the Jesus lizard, which can run across the surface of water. Why can it do that? Why can you skip a stone across water? You have this thing called surface tension. And it is a barrier to permeation. In the case of the lungs, that's problematic. But there's water here because, right, we're talking about tissues. So the, the lung cells, are the cells of the alveoli are surrounded by water. The capillary cells are surrounded by water. Oxygen basically should skip across the surface of that water. It would be very difficult for that oxygen molecule to cross through and break that surface barrier because of the surface tension that's going to be present. So we actually have to overcome that problem in the lungs to optimize oxygen exchange, carbon dioxide exchange in the other direction. So inside of your lungs, coating these alveoli, there's a material called surfactant.
And surfactant is this fluid that coats the interior of the L alveoli. Now that surfactant, it does two things. One, it acts as a surface tension reducing material. So we reduce the surface tension and it's easier to break that plane, that surface tension plane. And that helps to optimize exchange of these gases from one compartment to the other compartment. By the way, you didn't have that surface tension that allows gas to, the gases to more easily exchange. We didn't have that uh, surfactant, but it's very, very good. In fact, it would reduce our oxygen exchange so critically that our brain would begin to shut down. So very important that that's present. The other thing that it does is it helps to maintain the structure, basically it helps to maintain those LOB lines in their blown up structure. So every time you breathe in, you're not re-blowing those LV line up. And that's important because it's very, very painful to blow those LV line up. So it's a good thing we don't have to do it with every single breath. You only do it one time. Hopefully you only do it one time. And that's at first. And it's one of the main reasons that babies cry when they're born. It hurts when you are born because you are getting rid of the material that's in there, uh, the fluid that's inside of the lungs, and you're popping those alveoli out into their mature, uh, into mature structure, so that you can begin to breathe on your own out of the umbilical cord. All right, last component here of the lower respiratory tract are going to be the lungs. This is the growth structure, um, the large scale structure that contains all of these other structures that I've already, that I've already um, discussed. Anatomically, we would say or describe the lungs as being deep to the rib cage. This term deep, that's an anatomical descriptor, and it basically means just below the surface. I don't want to use the term below because below would indicate that it's below or near the floor. So we use the term deep just to say that it's it's just below the surface of the rib cage. It's deep to the rib cage. Now the lungs themselves are actually surrounded by a, a membrane. It's kind of like a Walmart a Walmart shopping bag or a couple Walmart shopping bags stuffed together. And you put the lung inside. So you have the lung, and then you have these two Walmart shopping bags, plastic Walmart shopping bags. So you have an inner membrane and then an outer membrane, and there's sort of a space in between between the two bags. But just like in those bags, it's not really it's not really a big space, right? It's potential to be a space. We know that there's space in there, but because the, the material adheres so tightly together, the space is normally not present. It's called the pleural membrane. Let me take a look here. Pleural membrane. So here is our pleural membrane with our two different, um, our two different layers plus then that potential space in between. Potential meaning that it has the potential to be a space, but under normal physiological circumstances, it's not a space. It adheres together real tightly, but has the ability to become a space. So these pleural membranes, what are they for? Well, one, they're for protection. And they're going to act as a surface protector between the lungs and then the bones of the rib cage. And this becomes really, really important because, as you are aware, every time you breathe, your rib cage is moving in and out as your lungs change volume. And so that pleural membrane is actually rubbing against the bones, that hard tissue. You just have to put your hands together and rub them together for a while to experience that, okay, that's going to create a lot of friction. And that heats up and that becomes very painful. If you rub your hands together for a long enough time, it's going to cause some damage, right? 
the lungs are literally moving 12 to 20 times each minute throughout your entire body. So you're, you're basically rubbing soft tissue against hard tissue constantly. We need to protect that. We need to reduce the impact of those bones from the rib cage on the lungs. And it's the pleural membranes that help out with that process. So the outer layer, which we call the parietal pleura, is going to line the thoracic cavity. So the very outer layer, which lines the thoracic cavity, is in contact with the bones of the rib cage. It's called the parietal pleura. The inner layer, which is in contact with the lung, which the lung are considered to be your visceral tissues. The visceral tissues of the visceral organs are all of the organs that we find in the thoracic cavity. Lung, heart, liver are all going to be visceral organs. So this inner layer is attached to the lung. And we call that the visceral pleura just because of its location. Make sure I spell that. So the inner layer is attached to the lungs and it's called the visceral pleura. So we have the parietal pleura on the outside, the visceral pleura on the inside, and then in the middle we have that cavity, which is a potential space. So, parietal visceral pleura can form a cavity between those two layers, called just simply the pleural cavity. Now, that pleural cavity is not just simply space. It's actually going to be filled up with something. It's filled with this material called pleural fluid. And that pleural fluid is a, a low viscosity fluid that helps to reduce friction. So now, every time the lungs move and the rib cage moves and we go through that expiratory process, we have a solution between those two pleural membranes that allows a very fluid, near friction free movement. Now, this pleural fluid, it actually is a, a very clear liquid. It looks quite a bit like water. It helps to make breathing easier. And if we compromise that fluid, if we try to breathe without that fluid, or if we just reduce the uh, ability of that fluid to create that near friction free environment, breathing becomes very, very painful. Now, just as a, uh, a side note here, Scripture tells us that Christ was pierced in the side, and there was water followed by blood. Does everybody remember that? I actually believed that when they pierced Christ in the side, that the water was the pleural fluid that began to drain, and then blood followed as they pierced through the lungs into that really high. Um, highly vascular part of the lung. 
So that would be a biological or physiological explanation for what we observe. Scripture finds that very, very well. Now, if we look at the whole lung, that whole lung is going to be divided into lobes. Okay? And you can actually sort of see those lobes here. You'll see that there are three, uh, three of those lobes over there on the right side. And there are two lobes here on the left side. So it's a little bit asymmetrical, not terribly asymmetrical. The reason that it is asymmetrical, though, is because right in the middle here is where the heart would exist. Right in this cavity here is where we find the heart. And even though the heart is actually centered in, uh, in the body, it's actually not over towards the left, it's tilted. And so the left part of the, of the heart is actually going to be the ventricle, which is slightly larger because of the bigger workload the heart has to perform. And so to accommodate that, the uh, lung on the left hand side is actually slightly smaller than the lung on the right to accommodate the, the tilt of the heart. So right side of the lung, we have three different lobes that are present, and then on the left side, the two lobes that are present. And again, the two lobes just to provide a bit more what we call the apex of the heart, which is that bottom surface of the heart uh, that peaks out where the left ventricles are located. Okay, so that's anatomy in a nutshell for the respiratory system. I want to shift gears here now, and I want to begin to talk about the process of actually utilizing the respiratory system to fulfill its um, it, its purpose of exchanging gases to supply oxygen to working tissue and to remove CO2 as it's produced by those working tissues. And we're going to start out with that first purpose. Anyone remember the first type of respiration? We had four different types. The other three were cell respiration, internal respiration, external respiration, moving air in and out of the lungs. Ventilation or breathing. Okay, so we're gonna call it we're gonna call it uh, ventilation. And what we need to do is actually deal with a little bit of physics here. And everybody loves physics. We're gonna deal specifically with mechanics. And we're going to deal with the mechanics of ventilation. So the mechanics of ventilation. And really, in the terms of mechanics, what we need to understand is an area of mechanics called fluid dynamics. And really, we have to deal with the pressure of, uh, or the physics of pressure. And there are a couple rules in which we need to play by when it comes to the physics of pressure. There's natural laws that tell us how pressure is going to um, respond to certain variation. The first rule is centered around how volume affects pressure. So if we look at the volume of container, we can actually determine with some level of uh, detail the pressure that's existing in that container. Because we know that volume and pressure are always inversely related. In other words, inverse just means that they're going to be the opposite. So if I increase the volume of the container, what happens to pressure? Using this first rule here, volume has to de or um, I'm sorry, pressure has to decrease if volume is increased. And then just the opposite, if I reduce volume, I increase pressure. So think about uh, can I borrow your water bottle? So this, this container has a volume. I'm not talking about the water that's inside. That has a volume as well. But I'm talking about the overall volume in the container. So if I begin to squeeze that container, I just reduce the volume. So inside of the container, there's more pressure. And if I release, I increase 
the volume of the container and pressure is just, just decreased. Now that principle that volume and pressure are inversely related and as I change the volume of a container, I alter the pressure of that container is going to lead towards the ability to use pressure and volume to induce movement. Now, whenever we're discussing the mechanics of breathing, we're dealing with a fluid. Fluids can be either gases or liquids. So it's not just simply discussing liquids here. And in case of breathing, it's actually a gas, right? Because we're dealing with air in this room, which is a gas. And we're going to call it a fluid. So fluids can be air or liquid. And we're going to use that fluid, that term, is what is describing the, the material that fills up the volume. So in the case of our water bottle here, the water is the fluid, it's a liquid fluid. The volume is the overall volume of the container, the bottle. And then the pressure is the pressures that are exhibited inside of that water bottle. And you're not going to be able to see it as well because you can drink just like the most perfect the milk here. But if I squeeze on that, what happens to the water? You probably can see it. What happens to the level of the water there? It actually goes up so it moves. Right? And we're going to use that principle there every time we breathe. So we got our fluid, we got the volume of the container, the pressure of the container. We're going to use the pressure by altering the volume to apply a force that acts on the fluid. So when I squeeze the bottle, it's not because I'm squeezing the bottle to change the volume that causes the, the, the water to move up. It's actually the fact that I'm increasing the pressure. And it's the pressure that pushes up on that water and gets the water to move. So pressure is going to be this force that acts on that fluid to cause movement. Now, the second principle that we need to understand is fluids are always going to move in a, in a predictable fashion. Fluids always travel Fluids are always going to travel from areas of high pressure to areas of lower pressure. And this shows up in a variety of different situations. So water in that bottle moves upward because that's where the high pressure was. What if I squeeze up here at the top? I don't know if it will be as evident here because it takes a lot of pressure to see this. You can see it just a little bit, especially if you compare it to the line on the, on the bottom there. So there's high pressure on top, lower pressure on the bottom. Where did the water move to? Down. So it went from high pressure on top to the lower pressure here on the bottom. Where's another place that we run into this principle? And it might be happening outside right now. Although it doesn't sound like rain. Not necessarily rain. Yeah, barometric pressure, which induces our wind. If we have a location, geographic location, let's say over, I don't know, Alabama, that's high pressure, and over here in Cleveland, it's low pressure. So let's say this is Huntsville over here. So Cleveland over here, high pressure to low pressure. How does, how does, a fluid always moves, the fluid in this case is the air, from high pressure to low pressure. It moves in that direction. And what do we call it? We call it wind. So wind is the same idea that high pressure pushes a fluid towards low pressure. So it becomes critically important that we understand that we can set up two different pressures, and both two different pressures are going to cause movement of a fluid. We call this whole idea a pressure gradient.
Now, we've run into a gradient before. Where have we run into a gradient before? Concentration gradients. High concentration in one area, lower concentration in another area. We can predict that we're going to have net movement from high concentration to low concentration. A pressure gradient is actually a special form of a concentration gradient. The pressure gradient is just simply saying that you have high pressure in one location, which is a lot of oxygen molecules or a lot of carbon dioxide molecules in one location. And the low pressure area is a low number of oxygen molecules. So it's just a special concentration gradient, but because we're dealing with changing the size and the volume of that space to get it to, to move, we're going to call it a pressure gradient. Okay, so with that basis in the physics of pressure and fluid dynamics, let's begin the process in the last couple of minutes of how to move air in and out of the lungs. Okay, so I want you just to give me your best shot at this. To move air into my lungs, what do I need to do? Okay, I need to breathe, and what am I actually doing when I'm breathing? I'm increasing the volume of my lungs, which does what to the lung pressure? Decreases. Okay? So now, out here in the environment, our barometric pressure, it really doesn't change that much, right? It's typically right around 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure, and it may increase or decrease a couple of millimeters. With my lungs, I can change the pressure very differently from that 760. So every time I breathe, I'm basically fluctuating around that 760. To move air in, I drop it way below the 760 millimeters of mercury. To move air back out, I increase the pressure way above the 760 millimeters of mercury. I'm alter, alterate, al, al, I'm changing my pressure gradients. <laughs> I'm altering my pressure gradients. To breathe in, I create a pe pressure gradient that favors the movement of air into the lungs. To breathe out, I create a pressure gradient that favors the movement of air out of the lungs. So moving air in and out, we're just talking about making pressure gradients. Now, of course, we always model things as biologists, right? In the term cycle, again, it's just simply one of the models or one of the types of models that we use. And a cycle is always a model that has no beginning or an end. It's basically modeled as a circle. Where else have we seen a cycle in biology, especially in this class? Towards the beginning of the semester, we talked about the cell cycle, where we went from interphase through mitosis to back to interphase, over and over and over again. Breathing cycle is going to have the same structure of going from one point through all these other points to return to the same original form. So it's a cyclical model. So this is going to be the steps in your breathing cycle. And the two steps or the two parts of the breathing cycle, this is where we'll end today. The first is called inhalation. It's when we inhale or also referred to as inspire. And so this is going to be air that comes in. The other part is to exhale, also called expire, which is air out. And so as this class expires, I hope I've inspired you to think about the mechanics of breathing. So real quick, as you're getting ready to pack up here, what type of pressure gradient do I have to create for my inhalation? So this is bringing air in. Pressure inside is going to be low. Pressure out here doesn't really change. So this is a constant, so I have to drop inhalation by pressure below that constant. The other side, <coughs> exhalation. Constant here has to become higher here. So I'm going to use my lungs, I'm going to change the volume to jump between low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, around that constant volume. 
All right, I'll see you all on Wednesday.